Bob's first communication, Bob Black's first communication to me about the idea for this series was a nine-page memorandum that he sent me back in February of last year. And in this document, which I reread last night, he sets out exactly what he's going to do. And it's a ridiculously ambitious <laughs> statement of intent that he put out here. He set out what was going to be in each paper, fully backed up with promises and commitments that I really didn't think he could possibly deliver. But he did. He delivered it. And with an unbelievably superb team, um, which actually, you told me this morning, didn't start in February last year, but really only got to work in September last year, um, he and his team have really done an amazing piece of work. And I do want to pay particular thanks to the leaders of those papers, to Zulfi Buter, to Mary Ruel, to Stuart Gillespie, and also to Lawrence Haddad, because what they have done is to really go so far beyond Nutrition One that we published several years ago, which was a fantastic piece of work in itself, and led, as I think we'll probably hear over the course of the day, to some important new initiatives in global nutrition. But what this series does is to unbelievably combine the science of the epidemiology with the interventions, with thinking more broadly about some of the wider determinants that shape the nutrition system, and then capping that off with an absolutely superb paper, let me say, that translates that evidence into a political strategy, a manifesto for action, which we rarely see in global health. We're really good at describing the problem. We're not very good at translating the problem into action. So a real thank you to the team for that work. If we look back over the last 15 years or so in the era of the Millennium Development Goals, it would not be fair to say that nutrition wasn't there. Uh, MDG 1C brings nutrition right into the center of the poverty agenda and makes it an important dimension of our thinking of development. But the truth is that although it was there in MDG 1C, it really wasn't central to the health-related Millennium Development Goals. It kind of sat outside of the concerns of the health community. And when one looks at one of the most important initiatives in the last few years that's tried to raise the profile of maternal and child health, uh, Every Woman, Every Child, fantastic initiative that broadens maternal and child health right the way through to reproductive and newborn health and all the way through to adolescence. Even there, nutrition hasn't quite got its place in the sun, if I may use a pun. It's very, very important that we learn the lesson of that. And, of course, when this series started, the work of the high-level panel chaired by the heads of state of Liberia, Indonesia, and the United Kingdom had not been published. <coughs> Last week it was published, and I hope you've all had a chance to read the high-level panel's report, because nutrition does achieve a very, very important part in that. Let me just remind you where nutrition sits. It has its own goal in the proposals from the high-level panel, it's goal five, which states ensuring food security and good nutrition. So it looks like we've made it as a community in the sense that it's got its own important priority for the next 15 years or so after 2015. But when you look at the detail, we need to be a little bit more circumspect because if you look at the individual targets that sit underneath that goal, there remains a great deal of uncertainty about what the target should actually be. So let me just briefly remind you of what those targets are. There are five that sit under the goal. The first one is to end hunger and protect the right to access to sufficient, um, safe, affordable, nutritious food. That's fine. The second one, though, is reduce stunting by, and in the document it says X percent, wasting by Y percent, and anemia by Z percent for under five. So you can see that the, that the panel was uncertain 
about what the evidence could tell us about what could reasonably be achieved over a 15-year time period. They want to get <coughs> targets in there, very important, but what those targets are, are still up for negotiation. And so any initiative that brings evidence to bear on that political process is really critical. And although we didn't plan it back in February last year, coming out a week after the high-level panel's report, it couldn't be more timely. So, Bob, you've got some sixth sense in the way you put this together to get that choreography perfect. But then the rest of the, the targets are not unimportant uh, to our discussion as well. Target 5C is to increase agricultural productivity by X percent. Um, target 5D, to adopt sustainable agricultural, ocean and freshwater fisheries practices. And then the final target is to reduce post-harvest loss and food waste by, again, X percent. I'm sure the X's are different in each case. But the point here is that not only is there uncertainty within the high-level panel report that I think our discussion could be informative about, but of course the high-level panel is only one strand of a series of political processes that are taking place over the next 6 to 12 months. So although we should feel good that nutrition and food security is there, we should not be complacent about its position in the political process. Now, if one looks at the incredible mobilization that's taken place over the last year or two around nutrition, in a sense, that's a response to the fact that nutrition wasn't central to the NDG agenda. But just look, we have Sun, we have David here representing the Scaling Up Nutrition um, Partnership. We have the IF campaign, we have a great Save the Children report that came out earlier this week. We have a UNICEF report. There's so many initiatives that have come out in parallel. But one thing about other areas of global health, and it's not the case, it's not going to be the case in the nutrition community, sometimes in other areas of global health, we never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. <laughs> so it's very important that while we've got all of these excellent initiatives running in parallel, we use this opportunity right now in this political process over the next few months to somehow unite these initiatives around a common agenda. There is nothing worse for a politician than to see infighting and disagreements and uncertainty amongst the community about what we want to achieve. So we must have robust discussion. We must have intensive debate. But we must have a clear objective in our minds that we must unite around some kind of common agenda. And there is no better place to start that common agenda with a review of the best available evidence and what that evidence can do to inform our policies, practices, and even our politics. We're going to start off then with Bob this morning, who's going to lay out um, some radically <coughs> new thinking about the way we look at nutrition and the burden, the epidemiology, of nutrition and its relation to maternal and child health. And one innovation in this series, of course, is that although we are mostly talking about undernutrition, we are not only talking about undernutrition, we are also talking about overnutrition. So we have a slightly broader agenda to think about here, and one question we should ask ourselves is how we connect the nutrition community to the non-communicable disease community. We live in these silos. I go to NCD meetings, maternal child health meetings, nutrition meetings. How do we build connections between these different, these different groups?